Welcome to the Healthy Gut Podcast with Rebecca Coombs, the place where you can learn how to achieve a happy, healthy gut. Here's what's coming up on today's show. Welcome to episode 75 of the Healthy Gut Podcast. And today I'm joined by the wonderful Dr. Jason Horolek, who is a researcher, a lecturer, a naturopath, and a Western herbalist with more than 17 years clinical experience. And he practices at Gould's Natural Medicine, which is a 136-year-old natural medicine clinic located in central Hobart, Australia. Today, Dr. Jason Horolek and I talk all around the microbiome and how having a diverse microbiome is key to optimal health. Jason talks with me about my recent Ubiome Explorer test results and what it actually means and why having such a diverse microbiome is important. So we talk about why you might consider having your microbiome diversity checked, how we can actually test for it, what these test results actually show us and what we should be looking for, and why we should be aiming for at least 40 plant-based foods per week. So, Dr. Jason Horolek, I'd love us to start off with the concept of more personalised assessment of a person's situation um, and doing tests like Ubiome, whether we should all be going off and doing these tests that um, give us a, comp- a, a pretty good picture of what's going on in our gut or whether we should just be doing more generic testing and hoping for the best. What's, what's your approach? Ooh. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, for, for me, who's been in this field for a long time, I was extremely excited when testing that was using up-to-date technology became available and became available at a, at a fairly affordable price. It was just like, whoa, this is great. So we don't have to guess as to what's going on and go, okay, well, you've had a course on antibiotics or you've uh, had chemotherapy, radiotherapy. I can read some studies and an idea of what happens to the mo- most people, but I also know from reading those studies that there are individual nuances as to what actually happens, irrespective of what that that sort of gut damaging event may be between antibiotic uses, that there'll be the occasional person that responds very differently than everybody else. Uh, and same with other sort of you know, herbal uh, and dietary interventions. So though, in terms of restricted diets, there'll be slightly differences in terms of, of, of how things um, turn out and how things are modified. So to have the opportunity to actually assess that on an individual level, I think has been fantastic because it means that we can don't have to guess anymore. We can actually look and see exactly how things are at and what impact that event has had potentially, or importantly, where you're actually at now um, and how to move forward from this time. Because that's really what the key aspect is about is if we can get a, a clear snapshot of the current scenario, we can really individualize dietary approaches and prebiotic usage usage rather than, again, just guessing um, and, and assuming what, what has actually happened or what your state of your system is. Definitely. So this might be a good time for us to sh- show what a Ubiome Explorer test result actually looks like. Um, I did this several months ago now, actually. And for those of you that are just listening to the audio podcast, head to thehealthygut.com forward slash diversity and you can see the link there so that you can watch this video component of the podcast and you can also see the um, information we're sharing now on Ubiome Explorer. Yes, so we've got my um, Ubiome Explorer tests test results up here. Now, the Ubiome Explorer test is super easy to do, unlike those traditional stool samples where you've got to collect stool and send it away and, you know, (laughs) no one loves to do that. This is really easy. You get basically a cotton bud. Uh, You wipe the toilet paper once you've wiped your bottom after doing a poo and you then just send that off in a tube. So it's so much less revolting and <laughs> yeah it's a very it's a very small sample it's it's true um, it is as, although I, I must say there is there is a research study that came out fairly recently that suggested that for those who are more keen on, on poo handling you can actually collect the whole sample in a 
Ziploc bag or something and mix and mush it about and then take a swab from the very center of that and you'll get a, a more accurate representation. <laughs> but it does take a different sort of person to do that versus the, the slight touch of a toilet paper. Yeah, yeah, you want to be really in into your body at that point, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about how this how this works because people will be thinking, oh, so if you're just taking a swab on toilet paper, what are they actually measuring? So what are you Biome Explorer tests actually picking up? Yeah, so tests like the Ubiome, because there's a few few that are on the marketplace these days, are essentially looking for bits of bacterial DNA. Um, and, and some of the newer ones look at fungi and protozoal DNA as well. And and this is quite different from the old style. The old style, we actually had to have a larger stool sample. We had to try to keep the bacteria alive from when they essentially your house to the lab and then grow them out in, the, in special dishes to see. And then we sort of count and have a look to see what showed up. Whereas now we just do that teeny sample because all essentially the, the bacterial DNA will be there and there'll be um, the, the actual amount of DNA that's there will just tell us the amount of that species present. And they essentially match a little segment of that DNA to their, to their library and go, okay, well, this belongs to this species, that belongs to that species here. So we get a very clear idea of what's present. And the lovely thing about the change in technology is <clears throat> how much more it allows us to see. Because using the old technology, which was in, widely in use until probably the early 2000s, um, we could see maybe maybe 70% of, or no, 30% of the species that are present in the gut. We missed about 70% because we just, they, we can't grow them um, very well. And, and with a lot of practice, once we know they exist, we can start growing them. But at that point, it's, you can't. So, you know, arguably most of what you have in your gut, you, you couldn't see previously until we changed your DNA. And now the, the cool thing is we did that, that small amount. And, and also we can, the, the liquid is designed to kill all the microbes at that exact time point so we get this perfect picture so even if it takes a month to get to the lab it doesn't matter whereas the previous one you've had if it took more than 24 or 48 hours to get there there will be changes in bacterial populations and we don't need to worry about that using the dna approaches are we missing any of the bacteria in this new dna testing um to, to, i'm trying to think of the best way of answering that in terms of, of bacteria that we know that exists no um, sometimes there'll be some species that 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 are are novel that we haven't had a name put, put a name to yet. So so I suppose those ones will, will potentially be missed in, in a report like the Ubiome. Um, other other labs can sometimes come up with you know um, taxonomy unavailable. So we know that this this unidentified species makes up you know one percent of what's there, but we don't necessarily know the significance or the name of it at that time point. But in terms of microbes that we know exist, then we. DNA picks them up very well. And, and as well, as I said, the ones we don't know, ex have, don't have a name yet, can also get picked up too. So here we have on the screen, for those of you just listening, do head to the website, thehealthygut.com forward slash diversity. So you can see these slides too. Um, so you get this overview where my wellness match score is 99.4%. That sounds great. What does that actually mean? That's a very good question, and I don't think it actually means that much. So I always tell my, my patients not, it looks impressive, but not to pay that much attention. And I think in this case, they're looking at people who describe themselves as generally healthy, what their bacteria, look, and this is a, a biome derived marker. So I think looking at, at people who describe themselves as healthy, uh, what their ecosystem looks like, and then they're matching is how, how, how good do you match as other people who describe themselves as healthy? I think that's what they're we're doing in that case. Um, for me, um, and from a you know, more objective researcher perspective, it's the diversity that we see on this first page that is key. Yeah, so we can see that your diversity of your sample is the 62nd percentile. Yeah, so that means that your sample is more diverse than 62% of those in the UBiome Ubi Poo library. And that Poo library contains hundreds of thousands of samples now, so it actually gives you a very good indication of where you're at in that spectrum. So that's better than average, but it's still not, not ideal. And, and, and for, for me, it, um, I would like to aim high, so I suggest my patients aim to get up to the 85, 90th percentile with, with diversity score. And diversity essentially takes into account two, two factors. One is the number of different, um, in this case, genera uh, present, um, as well as the spread of those two, because if your ecosystem is dominated by one or two species dramatically, then even if you have 150 others in teeny tiny amounts, you'll still have a low diversity score, even though your, your richness, species richness is good. So um, one thing I always do is look at both those aspects of going, okay, are you 
very much dominated by one species or two or three, or do you have a good spread, but also how many actual genera are there? And in your case, your spread is quite good and your genera richness is, is quite good too. Yeah. Um, so I always, I'm a bit old fashioned, I like using papers, so I always copy and paste in a, in a particular way into my, uh, a Word document. And there were some people whose species or genera um, copy and paste will cover like down to three and a half pages and other people's half a page. So from that rough guide, I can idea of genera richness and you're sort of, you know, on the, on the better end, <laughs> a bit above normal in that respect. And diversity is very much impacted by things. So many things are outside our control, like what we were seeded with originally at birth, you know, um, so what ecosystem our mother had, whether we we're exposed to antibiotics in that early time period, whether we were born by a C-section or vaginal birth, whether we were breastfed or formula fed, all those things impact our our diversity from that point onwards. But then every course of antibiotics will decrease diversity a little bit more. And every time we do a combination of antibiotics, where they do two or three antibiotics at the same time, or you, you take them for longer periods of time or higher doses for, 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 for bursts, you'll get a more dramatic decrease in diversity. And some species bounce back fine, the, the big players, but those that are there at the teeny tiny amounts um, are the ones that we worry about going extinct um, from, from that sort of intervention. And similar things happen with chemotherapy and radiotherapy, for example, is we actually get a loss of diversity. So you obviously can't change what happened in your early years. <laughs> In your, your birth process, so you sort of have what you're, you're at at that point, um, but you can work from where you're actually at now. Yeah. Do we know and, if babies start with 100% diversity, or if our mothers, say, had 82% diversity, do we start with what she had? How does it work? Yes. Do you know how it works? It, it essentially works like that. So, so you can only pass on what you have as, 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 as parents. So if, if you only have 82 species present, you can't pass on 100, you can only pass on that 82. And this is the thing with Westerners, why we've seen with every generation a, a, a lowering of diversity, because every generation takes more antibiotics and, and has you know, more interventions that, including diet, you know, Western diet would be in that category too. Um, and we're you know, having more formulas fed and more C-section for kids. So, so our, as every generation goes down, our diversity scores are getting less. So that means we start off with a lot less species than what we once had. I think people are, are quite clear on when you take antibiotics, they kill bacteria and that's going to impact our diversity and it's going to kill off bacteria that live within us. Um, can you explain why diversity is reduced when we're not breastfed? What, what happens in the breastfeeding process to support diversity in, in an infant? Yeah, that's a very good question. And and I think it's because of the extras that you get with breast milk versus the formula. So formula, yeah, you get vitamins and minerals and proteins and sugars. That's all good. But what you don't get is bacteria. <laughs> this is the, the key difference. And within within breast milk, you're getting over a billion bacteria per liter. And then there's some research showing there's a hundred different species of, of bacteria that have been found in breast milk at, at, at any given time. And that even changes as the child ages as well <clears throat> and it's almost as if the, the it's a fascinating thing because it's actually there's bacteria that are sampled from the gut that's our current thinking and then brought up to the to the breast and the, the, the types of bacteria that are sampled change as the, the infant gets older as well so there's actually a different number and different type and different spread of species that gets get introduced in, in uh, different time points and obviously with formula even if I add a probiotic to it when you get one or two different species which is completely different than what you're getting with with breast milk and on top of that you're getting you know uh, a range of um, special sugars called oligosaccharides that are indigestible in breast milk that are are unique to the mum to feed up those sort of species in, in the infant's gut as well in, in a very selective way for, for preference, preferencing microbes that have a healing anti-inflammatory um, effects and that, that train the immune system to, to function properly because that's one thing we know that the microbiome is extremely important for is training the immune system to, 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 to behave like it's supposed to. I mean, you can see people who are who, like myself that, that essentially um, I've got you know, a history of, of asthma and hay fever and because my immune system wasn't trained to be, to behave properly. <laughs> it went AWOL at a, at a very young age. Um, yes, yeah, so we've got that, that sort of time point and, and, and the, the, the bacterial composition at that early window actually dictates how your immune system gets get behaves from from that point onwards, which is pretty impre um, important to know. And it also changes how you, you view those early life experiences as well. 
And I, it now makes sense to someone like me who was, I was born vaginally, but I was born two months premature. I wasn't breastfed because the doctors in 1978 thought breast milk was, was bad, which, oh yeah. gosh, and mum was very sick. Um, so she wasn't in a great state when I was a, a a newborn baby. And then I was sick. I reacted very strongly to formula and cow's milk. So I pump, got pumped full of antibiotics over my whole childhood because I yeah. then had a lot of food intolerances. So when I think about it, when I look back at my history now, I think it's actually amazing I'm at the 62 percentile um, given how yeah. much uh, damage was you know, I just had sledgehammer after sledgehammer after sledgehammer going into my poor little um, gut and immune system with the, with every yeah. subsequent round of antibiotics. And I spent years on antibiotics as a child. Yeah, and your story is is more at the extreme end, but there's there are similarities I can assure you, amongst many Westerners these days, and I think that explains why diversity scores are as low as they are. And then we we top that off with with Western diet, which you know, I grew up eating that Western diet and I wasn't, I was born generally, but not, not given any breast milk either. And I was amazed at my diversity scores, which was actually quite, quite good. Uh, but then, you know, I, I, since I was 18 and, and, and sort of changed my life around and then changed my diet, et cetera, that I've really had minimal impact of, of any interventions that would, would cause damage. So, so that's a nice thing is knowing that, okay, that yes, you, you, have what you were born with and you're sort of stuck and then that's early childhood again you can't change that um everyone did the best they could in those circumstances and we know differently now and we could go back in time and change it if we could but we can't so we're stuck with where we're at um but you can still move move forward from here and prevent any further loss of diversity and the the, the interesting thing too is that we can improve diversity scores and this um, both in terms of sp spread, but also in terms of species that are that show up on testing. And I suppose that, that what I just said there is the important bit of what shows up on testing, because there are a number of species that are there in teeny, teeny, tiny amounts below detectable thresholds. So they won't show up when you do this test, but if you start feeding those species up, then their populations rise to the point where they can be detectable. And then you actually will have a longer species list than what you did before. So it's not like you've actually introduced new species, but you've just regrown ones that are just hanging on at the edge of extinction. So that, that is one of the core aims that I have as a clinician is to, is to, to improve diversity that way. Um, in terms of adding to that diversity from an external source, we know we can do that with fecal transplants. Um, and there's a, there's a burgeoning amount of research in that area now. And in theory, breast milk will do that too. There just hasn't been the research there yet, but because breast milk actually contains 100 plus different bacterial species, um, chances are that would be a way of reseeding or re-inoculating as well. And that's, that's a good thing to know with young kids if they do have to have a course of antibiotics for an infection that otherwise can't be treated. And you know, antibiotics we know save lives, they save limbs, so they have their place, um, but they just shouldn't be used flippantly and sometimes they are. Um, but when they need to, we know if the child at, at, at one and a half or two is still breastfed, or even at six months or nine months, whatever that time might be, then that will actually re-inoculate that child with those same strains from the mum. So, so we actually don't have to worry about it in the same way. And I think that's the other benefit of breast milk that we don't get with, with formula. Mm, that's interesting. What about um, in terms of someone like me, I've come in at the 62 percentile. Will I ever get back to 100% or would I just more likely get back to where I started with what, whatever my mum gave me? Let's say I started at 85%. Is that more realistic that I would get back to 85% if I did everything right and, uh, and really the, nourished my gut? Good question. There will be limitations there because once a species is extinct is extinct. So once it's actually lost and we can't do anything about you can't feed it back up to existence or, you know, but we can feed ones that are, that are at the edge of extinction back up to, to, to a higher amount. So it'd be picked up. So there'll be limitations um, of, of where you can actually get to and you will, you won't be able to get back to how you were at that initial time period because of all those interventions in between is that certain species would have gone extinct, whereas others were just brought down to below that detectable threshold. Those ones we can bring back, but the ones that are extinct, without, as I said, we're doing a fecal transplant or, or breast milk infusion, there's probably no way of, of bringing, introducing those species back in. We will come to FMTs in a little bit, but first I'd love us to actually look at what my diversity was, what I had living in me, what 
we could see yeah. was in uh, yeah. in good numbers, in perhaps higher than we'd like them, and, and what was lower, and how that really shaped what we then did with my with the next phase of treatment for me. Yes, we'll do that. I'll just, I might have to adjust my screen a little bit so I can see this full screen here. Sure. So they've just recently changed their interface, which is uh, still fine. It just takes longer to find things when you're used to a certain old interface. So then you click on advanced here, um, and then we get essentially what I generally look at is, is file level data first. Um, and from this, the file up for, for bacteria to be in the same file, it, it doesn't actually mean that they're that closely related. You know, it, it's like it's as close related as we might be to, to um, lizards and sharks. You know, it's like we have backbones. <laughs> that's that's the, the thing that, that we have wit and we're in the same file. Um, we're, so, so with bacteria, they might be quite distant related, but there are some things like I always look at the proteobacteria account because all the bacteria within that category, which are actually very diverse um, grouping, um, contain a just part of their 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 build their their structure it's like we have you know fingernails and hair um they have uh, something called lipopolysaccharide or um, also known as endotoxin which is very pro-inflammatory in this particular group of bacteria so uh, we know that that you know proteobacteria populations can vary between between 0.05 percent to i've seen them up to 25 percent of what's there and that's huge, huge variation. And that uh, has a huge impact on the inflammatory terrain that that person has to deal with because um, as those bacteria die and turn over in the gut, which happens rapidly, they release that endotoxin into the gut. And if 25% of what's there is endotoxin rich and very pro-inflammatory endotoxin rich, that's what you're absorbing. And that causes, you know, we know now is linked to, to, to body-wide inflammation, depression, anxiety, uh, changes in blood sugar regulation, uh, increases in weight, uh, even linked to cardiovascular disease in terms of actually getting that sort of clotted plaques build up. And um, even chronic fatigue syndrome have all been linked to, to endo, endotoxins yeah, in the gut. So this is an extremely important area to look at. Now, yours was very good. So I was happy to see that when I opened that one up. That 1.36%, typically in Westerners, we'd be looking at at 4 to, 4 to 5% would be a typical proteobacteria count in Westerners, but that's often a lot less in hunter-gatherer societies. Um, and as I said, in some individuals, you know, I saw one last week that was 25% of that ecosystem and that was one of the highest I've seen of proteobacteria, but there'd be certain disease states like cystic fibrosis where I've read of some people uh, in, in research studies having 65% of that particular um, file, which is huge, absolutely huge. And you can see why they have a, a range of microbiome issues and, and other issues throughout their system as, as part, potentially as partly its consequence of that. So from there, um, we look at, at genus level data and this tells us the most about your, your diversity. Because here we get an idea of what genera make up the bulk. And, and, and some people, particularly those that have recently taken antibiotics, particularly antibiotic cocktails or chemotherapy, their bacteroides might be at the 60, 70, 75% of that ecosystem. And the reason why is because they tolerate antibiotics and chemotherapy insults fairly well whereas a lot of our other microbes don't. So they're like, ah, my competition's gone. I've got lots of food. I've got lots of space. So they grow into that in that scenario. Um, and that's problematic um, for a few reasons. But one, your diversity score goes down dramatically because just one species is such a dominant player or one genera is such a genus is such a dominant player in that ecosystem. But for you, your spread is actually very good. And that we back to what is at pretty much what I call the perfect level around that 20% mark, good levels of Fecalobacterium, Blotty, and Roseburia. And for most people, those would be the, the top four species. For the vast majority of people we see, they'll just be in different orders depending on what their sort of dietary exposure is. And can we talk about those top four? What Do we know what their roles are in the body? We do. And, and this is being further refined. And, you know, I'd say in another five years, we'll I'll be able to talk a lot more on these species than what I can now. Uh, we can say that that Blotty and Roseburia are two of the key butyrate producing microbes in your in your gastrointestinal tract, and butyrate is one of the most important and far reaching short chain fatty acids that um, that is produced in the gut. Now, all the bacteria here will produce some some metabolites that we call short chain fatty acids, but only some can produce butyrate. And butyrate has a you know, healing effect on the on the colon, a healing effect on the small intestine, uh, helps improve blood sugar regulation, helps improve mitochondrial function, heals up you know, damaged blood brain barrier, decreases inflammation in the brain. It's, it's amazing substance, 
and some people again may only have maybe 50 60 percent of their ecosystem will be actually composed of b-trade producers and you'll find others that that's eight to ten percent and that has a huge impact on their overall health and well-being and has an impact on the, the disease state that they're often presenting with and it gives us an in for actually altering that when they're at that sort of 10 or 12 percent good mark because you know that's way below um normal let alone optimal and and luckily for you you're you're actually in that sort of optimal range if we add up a number of the b-trade producers including things like pseudobacterial vibrio and subdella granulum etc your number two is fecalobacterium prosnitzii and fecalobacterium is the dominant species we tend to see in um, in you know health healthy more diverse gut ecosystems um, and those with higher counts of bacteroides we tend to see associated with with lower diversity scores now now you as I said was actually that that's probably the perfect or a little bit lower than that's fine too with bacteroides but those that have bacteroides at, at 30 40 50 60 percent plus you'll see generally there'll be a very corresponding low diversity score um, almost 100 percent of the time and Fecalobacterium is, is also a key B ray producer, but it also produces other anti-inflammatory gut healing compounds too. So it's sort of had additional beneficial effects beyond what we currently know with Blotty and Roseburia. Mm. Yes. And there's oh, there's obviously been a lot of talk in recent times around the presence of particular bacteria that are more commonly associated with people that are overweight and then other bacteria that are more commonly associated with people who are very lean. Uh, I was asked by people, you know, should we be looking for these bacteria in our gut? Um, and I'd like us to talk about mine, <laughs> what we saw yeah. in my results as well in terms of what those bacteria are called and which ones are associated with, with which kind of end of the scale in terms of weight. Okay. Now, that's probably the thing we should go back to first, and I'll see if I can find that because I think it's worth flagging, is if we look at, at the ubiome section on what they call the body weight section, it's worth flagging a couple of things here. One is this idea of the Firmicutes back to Roditis ratio, that at one point when this first research hit the headlines back in 2006, I think it was, um, linking gut bacteria and, and weight and metabolic health. That research suggested that this ratio of Firmicutes to Bacteroidetes was very important and, and quite pivotal. And a couple of subsequent studies showed the same in animals and in humans. So people were like, okay, this is a definite rule. And the way science works, sometimes future um, research tells the complete opposite or, or finds that there's no such thing as, 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 as this relationship being important for that particular scenario. And that's really what's happened is that there's a lot of subsequent research that's found the opposite than, than what that original research did or found that there is no relationship between body weight issues and this frequencies back to ratio. So based on current data, I'd say ignore th that section uh, and, and the, the apparent importance of that, that ratio, because I don't think that's supported by current data, you know, and there's a lot of, people not just biome who, who are stuck in that sort of 2006 2009 time period when that research was was pivotal we had that idea but you know research has evolved since then but what is consistent is the data around things like acromansia acromansia is one of those species that is sadly um not infrequently extinct in, in some of my patients guts due to you know very prolonged very restricted diets and underwater usage and um, has, has essentially eliminated those in those patients, uh, which is always sad when, when it's actually properly extinct uh, because it is one of those species that we see as key and pivotal for maintaining good gut integrity. Um, and we know that, that having you know, the lack of a leaky gut, normal gut integrity is important and acromancy is one of the key drivers of having a normal gut integrity. And we also know that those people that have Lower acromantia have had more trouble shifting weight, and those with higher amounts of acromantia respond better to weight loss interventions. And there's been some interesting research, both in animals and some preliminary research in humans, actually administering acromantia to help with metabolic health and weight loss with good results as well. So um, in terms of a, a probiotic base in acromantia, I think we're still a few years away from that, although it will probably pop up in Europe before it ever if it ever <laughs> reaches Australia. Um, so we'll watch this space. Australia tends to be a bit slow adopting to, to certain things. Um, but that one is definitely one that is supported by research. And from there... Um, and just on, just for those who are listening, where do my acromansia sit uh, from what we've seen in the results? Am I high? Am I low? Am I or average? Yeah, so from their perspective, comparing you to their selected samples, you're about half 
uh, half of that. Now, for me, that doesn't necessarily mean as much. And we'll go back to, if I can find it, the advanced section. And we'll look at the actual amount that's present, which I find far more useful myself. And we can see the Ackerman amounts is 0.99%. So the average Ackermans in healthy people we see is between 1% and 3%. So you're essentially just there at that lower end of normal. But in a situation where we're wanting to, to if we want to work on, on metabolism and, and weight, et cetera, then we, put, we work on increasing acromantia in that scenario. Yes, that would make sense. And what the research also tells us in terms of, of microbiome markers that are important for you know, metabolic health and, and, and weight health are diversity. Is one of those two that people with, with lower diversity scores often have, have more metabolic health issues and then conversely the opposite higher is associated with better metabolic health outcomes and also the presence of another species that mo people that in your audience will be more familiar with which is bifidobacteria bifidobacteria is also shown in, in, in much more of the more recent research as being pretty pivotal for both again gut integrity um and for preventing you know, bacterial endotoxins from getting into your system, but also for, for metabolic health, as well as other things like improved mood too, which is always a bonus. And this is where you are below, <laughs> far more below than where, where perhaps it's ideal in that your bifidobacter is there. Thankfully, there, again, there are people where it's actually extinct. And I think and it's far more problematic when it looks, and it's apparently extinct or actually is. Um, Thankfully, most patients I find that who are apparently extinct or that shows up as below detectable levels were able to, to bring up again through some nurturing care over a period of two to four months. Um, but about 20% of people, particularly those with higher antibiotic usage, um, it, it is actually gone from that ecosystem. And we can see for you, it's 0.08%. And, you know, I, I, ideal for me is, is between sort of two and a half and 5%. So you're, you know, a fair bit off that. But... <laughs> If it's there, it's actually pretty easy. If you can do the changes in diet, you can take the right prebiotic supplements to bring that up into a healthy, healthy zone. Yeah. So it's, it's just a challenge when it's not there at all. You can't, you can't do that. If it's there, it's actually pretty easy to modify in most cases, as long as, as you're able to take, um, take the foods that feed it. I think that's the key thing is, is that if you can't ingest the right foods or prebiotics, then, then it's pretty hard to, to bring that species up. But if you can, then that population will get up because you're giving essentially selective fertilizer to, to nourish that particular species. We will talk about this next approach in terms of feeding the microbiome. But before we move into that, I just want to check if there's any other uh, sort of key things we should be looking at when we're looking at this. Uh, we're, we're going through my Ubiome Explorer results, whether there's anything you want to highlight or call out before we move into that personalized are treatment. Yeah, fair enough. And I think that's probably the, the core aspect, but there are other things we look at too. So at least I look at, <laughs> and we can see where it goes down and, and that below detectable thresholds around that 0.01% mark. So when, when a species is present at less of that amount, um, it won't necessarily show up on the test results. And, and, and you go down a bit more than that, it definitely won't show up. It's just the limits of technology that we have. But once you feed that species up to the point of, of here, around that 0 0.01 or 0 0.02, it'll get picked up by the test. And that's sort of how you bring up diversity. Um, yes, yeah, so the, the other thing to flag is there are a number of species here that we have no idea what they do, what role they play. We just realized that they're there. Um, and this is really because of that leap in technology has allowed us to see that they exist but we haven't had the chance to actually um, define what they do and what role they play and what percentage they should be. So most of these species on this list are, are like that at this point in time. So again, in 10 years time, you probably will just speak for hours on all the different species that show up here that we just don't know much about now. So what, what I do with my results now is focus on those species that we do know as, as key players for either improving health, um, associated with better health outcomes or the opposite, the ones that are actually are detrimental to health and produce byproducts that are, that are harmful. Um, and on the latter category, we can include species like the Sofa Vibrio, which the yours was at 0.33%, and then Bilophila at 0.17%. Um, and both those are key hydrogen sulfide gas producers. Hydrogen sulfide gas is, again, a byproduct that only a small number of species in your gut can produce. And a small amount of it is actually fine and normal and, and your body can deal with it quite well. It's just that when you get above a certain point, it actually causes gut inflammation and importantly, visceral hypersensitivity. And for patients who have irritable bowel syndrome, for me, this is often a key driver 
of that or or just you know, abnormal sensations in the the colon as well as you get those patients who who can't tolerate you know gas or the, even the feeling of um, feces and that build up in that lower left quadrant is often because of that visceral hypersensitivity um, and the key driver of that is the is overproduction of hydrogen sulfide gas you know so that tells us okay um, it's it's not it's pretty pretty common for me with working with IBS, a lot of IBS patients for these levels of those two species to be high, uh, and they would be contributing to that ongoing visceral hypersensitivity. They may not have been the main initial driver, which could have been you know in the case of traveler's diarrhea or food poisoning, but they will be keeping that bubbling along. Is it also an indicator that you've got hydrogen sulfide SIBO? That will probably wait on on more research, yeah, because we're, we're that when that test that easy to do test for, for, you know, small bowel hydrogen sulfide comes, comes in, we might be able to start correlating it with, with large gut. Um, I would guess probably <laughs> based on that, um, it would make sense. We, we see it with methane most of the time too, that those that are, have higher amounts of you know, methane producing microbes in the colon also have in the small bowel and those that have in the small bowel almost always have it in higher amounts in their colon. So it wouldn't surprise me if that's the case, but I don't think at least not that I'm aware we don't have data correlating those two yet. Which are the bacteria that are correlated with higher methane? I know my methane SIBOers will be like, what are those ones? <laughs> yeah, that one actually doesn't show up on this particular finding because it's... Um, I don't have methane SIBO. I have never had it. I'm always hydrogen dominant. So that's probably ah, well, that's, why we're not seeing it on my results. Well, that, that's one, one potential reason. But the, the main issue is you actually have to go find it a different way because it doesn't show up in this interface. You actually have to go to downloads and you have to click on the download the T CSV file, which is an Excel file, and then you have to search for it manually. And then you can see whether methane or Riverbacter smithii shows up there. And it often does in people that are, that are methane dominant SIBO. Wonderful. So should we move on to um, talking about how we then personalize the treatment protocol for me? Yeah, yeah. So, so obviously, one of the core aspects is, is working on on diversity because that is something that pretty much all microbiome researchers around the world will will agree. <laughs> There's always this debate, discussion, in scientific circles, but not amongst that. That that is a, a core um, marker of of good health. Yeah, so, so focusing on that is important. So, really, the way to do that is trying to nourish up those species that are are below that detectable threshold. You know, that's besides introducing other species with feces or breast milk, that's the only way that we've got. So some species in your, in your, your, your gut are very flexible with their food. That they'll eat some protein, they'll eat some bile, they'll eat some sugar, they'll eat some different ranges of fibers. Th those ones tend to survive restricted diets pretty well because there'll always be something there for it to eat. But there are other species that um, have very selective food requirements. And if we don't feed them, um, they will eventually go extinct. <laughs> I'm not sure quite where that time frame is, um, but they'll stay there. The, uh, but their populations will diminish and diminish over time. So the idea is is that you increase the diversity of your diet with with essentially f plant foods that will feed those species that have a more um, niche diet. So you know we have this idea of fiber being fiber, but it's not. Fiber comes in all different shapes and sizes, and it's the different shapes and sizes that dictate what microbes can eat it. And, you know, we get pectins, we get gums, mucilages, insoluble fibers, soluble fibers, and all those different shapes and sizes. And in plant foods, we get polyphenols and, and of all different shapes and sizes for, you know, between blueberries and raspberries and um, black currants and pomegranates all have different polyphenols. And what they have in common is the lack of digestibility. So none of those polyphenols will get absorbed. They reach the colon where they feed microbes. So that's the idea of having a rainbow of, of food colors and a wide spectrum of plant fibers on a daily basis so you can nourish and feed that uh, the widest spread of bacteria possible and we know that people that follow that dietary approach have have a better diversity score and i can also say from years as a clinician now that that is a key way of improving diversity scores jason i might just get you to stop sharing your screen so people can look at your faces uh as we keep uh, yeah. talking um it's always better to look at someone. So you just go, yeah, there we go. Perfect. Okay, that means I can look more freight on freight. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So a question I often get asked by people is, how on earth do I increase the diversity of my plant-based food when I can barely tolerate anything? I react to everything. I want to increase the diversity of my gut, but I'm terrified of doing it because it makes me feel so sick. How do you approach that? 
Yeah, it's, it's obviously far more more challenging. And I do work with patients who are in that boat, and, and it's easier for everyone when they're um, you know, working with a patient that, that can eat everything. It's a pretty simple process of, of improving that diversity score. But in those that, that can't, it's more challenging. And I think for me as a clinician, the key point is trying to work out why that is. Why are they having trouble with that, that those sort of breadth of foods and those types of foods? And from there, it's working out, okay, what can we do to treat that underlying issue? Because there's often interventions that we can take to improve salicylate intolerance or amine intolerance, to improve uh, you know, visceral hypersensitivity, that, which is why they're not going well with legumes or onions and garlic. You know, it may take three months of work or six months or nine months of, of specific targeted work on that area. Or obviously if it's SIBO that we have to sometimes deal with the SIBO, we have to deal with the SIBO first and then, then work on, worry about the, the large bowel as a consequence afterwards. Um, but with all the patients that I've worked with, I can say, I can't think of any failures to date, no touch with them, um, that we've been able to actually bring that, that food count up. Um, with with care and sometimes it's slow you know and in that in some people it, it's a slow process but i can i can say from some that i've worked with for, for a couple of years that were people that were living off of you know four foods or eight or ten foods is that they're actually now eating a, a much wider diversity of foods and their gut is going much better as a ecosystem is going much better as a consequence and they're tolerating those foods well and obviously their quality of life has improved because they are aren't just stuck to eating you know um, peeled pears and chicken they can actually eat a wide variety of foods yeah so so i think we can get there it's just trying to work out what the cause is that's that's not allowing them to 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 expand that and work on that underlying cause and and once we do that we can expand the diet and what are the types of things that you look for when you're looking for those underlying causes of those quite strong reactions to foods yeah, so, so some of that will be around i mean for me it's looking at gut permeability it's looking at at, at a new biome itself test similar to that that gives you an idea of what microbes may be contributing to you know gut damage and, and that could be leaky gut that could be visceral hypersensitivity and what microbes are absent that might be healing that process yeah so so that, that gives us one way of looking at that as well um and and really it's taking a thorough his, case history too that will give some clues as to that and they will often have an idea of what food groups are problematic and that can give us some clues of of particularly in conjunction with their history of, of what lined up to create the current situation. And once we do that, it's relatively easy. It, it takes time, but it's, it, you, can, you can target the treatment at that time point. You know, so if it's you know, leaky gut, that's, that's essentially meant that they now don't deal with salicylates very well. There are ways of coming in. Like, all right, yes, we have to focus on healing that leaky gut with things that you can take. We can, there's other interventions we can try that can, can, help improve your tolerance of salicylates in the meantime so we can again expand your diet and feed some of those microbes that help heal up the leaky gut so there are ways about doing it and that's where it gets even more individualized on top of on top of this because yeah yeah i can look at that and go this is what the things that would, that would actually fix that ecosystem make it much healthier diversity wise increased levels of beneficial microbes and decreased levels of antipathogenic ones that part is relatively straightforward it's just individualizing that to that patient takes another level of um practice <laughs> to do too because then because that's where the fine tuning comes and having ancillary things to help improve their their tolerance to the interventions that will help with the underlying issues you talk about eating ideally 40 or more different plant-based foods um are we aiming for cupfuls of each thing is it teaspoonfuls how do we start i think sometimes people get quite uh, fixated on the quantity size of the food as much as trying to get uh, to 40. Okay. Yeah, I, I think don't be so fixated on the quantity side. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's a point at which it'll be too low to be much help. So, you know, having a, a pinch of coriander, it's probably, I, I wouldn't count that in my food. But if you took a teaspoon of coriander, I think that would be sufficient to actually add different plant phytochemicals and different fibers to, to actually really reach your microbiome and then feed something. So I think anything from that point onwards can be included. And, and sometimes you're going slow. I think even a tablespoon of, of red lentils, that's counting. That should be counted. It's, it's, that might be the most you can do at that time point. That's totally fine. And that's the way that you're, you're helping to, to build up to the point that you might be able to tolerate eating half a cup, but you start off with, with a relatively small amount in some of those people. So, so, for me, it, it's it, there's a minimum dose below which I probably wouldn't count, which is probably that sort of teaspoon load. But above that, I'm I'm happy to count it. 
you know, and, and the other thing I should flag is that there's nothing that's magical about the 40 mark. It's, a, it's a, something that, that I, I worked at that I came up with, okay, this will stretch most people, but it's doable. Yeah, and we know that, the, and that now I've seen clinically that that seems to make a difference, but there are patients who go be up, above and beyond that up to 50 and 60, which is, which is great, um, and that should actually have further benefits beyond that. But I know that that level um, is far less scary than going, all right, go for 80 foods per week or 60 foods per week. So I think 40, um, for most people, as I said, bearing other things in the background that, that are preventing that is, is actually doable by, by stretching out. And when you actually go through and count what you have on a, on a week, people are often at that 20 or 30 mark anyway, and it's not that much of a leap upwards. Yeah. But I, I know there are other people that are stuck at the 10, 10 mark um, because of their health issues. And then, as I said, it's a, a more convoluted and slower process, but we can get there. When I first counted, I did a week where I just counted rather than just trying to, you know, yeah get to 40 or more. And I was actually really surprised. I thought um, that I might be at about 20 and I was actually in the mid thirties when I just okay. counted my standard, not trying too hard diet. Um, and then when I started really concentrating on it, I would go down to my local fresh fruit and vegetable market and something that I would do. And I'm lucky. I recognize that I'm in a much better position these days than I was when I first got SIBO with my SIBO relapsing this time, my gut is in a better state and I can tolerate a lot more foods. And so I would go to my fresh food market and I'd stand there and I'd look around at all the fresh produce and I'd say, well, what haven't I eaten in a long time? What have I never eaten? What would be yeah. interesting to try and cook? And I would stop just going and buying carrots, broccoli and squash because that becomes a pretty staple SIBO yep. <laughs> for me anyway, yeah. a vegetable staple. And I'd go and buy different foods. I also started getting a box. Well, I, I go on and off with this. I have a, a, an organic um, fruit and vegetable home delivery service. And that's a really great way to get different produce in your kitchen because they send it to you. You don't. They, they, well, they I do. Don't. <laughs> and uh, it's a great way to get diversity in. And I was actually, when I was really concentrating on this, I was hitting anywhere between 70 and 80 different foods per week, but I was also doing fresh herbs and spices. And that was a really great way to add mm. different plant-based foods into my diet and also nuts and seeds. Um, and yeah. I was starting to bring in some different red foods. Now we'll talk about red foods because that was one of the recommendations for me was it to was. increase my red foods. And I have been very conscious about that. And I'd like us to talk a bit about why for me, red food has been an important factor for me to concentrate on. What is it about red foods that can be beneficial to my gut? Yeah. To your gut, the main reason for, for recommending foods that are rich in red polyphenols um, were, was your acromantia. Yeah, we know that, that there's been a number of studies now showing that acromantia has quite a liking for, for red polyphenols from a number of different food sources, whether that be red grapes or cranberries or pomegranates. So it doesn't seem to be that picky as to the, the exact configuration of that red polyphenol, but it seems to like it. So the idea with that recommendation is to just provide that food source so that commands is like, yeah, I've got my, one of my preferred food sources always there because that's really the way that we find will increase populations of that, that species. So that would include things like red rices as well. You can get them red carrots and red potatoes. Again, sometimes if you're lucky with your farmer's markets, you, you can get that um, as well. But luckily red, red rice these days, gosh, that's relatively easy to come by. Like I know 10 years ago that I had to special order red rice from the, the US um, to actually to get it in and then eventually quarantine said, no, you're not allowed to bring in any whole grain rice. I was like, no, you can't take my red rice away from me. But, but yeah, but, it, but they've worked around that now. Now it's, you can buy it Woolies and Coles, let alone at that, you know, organic versions at, at, at um, local greengrocers and organic shops. Well, I, I can attest to red rice being quite easy to come by. I have a big bag of it in my pantry. It's really delicious. It's got quite a nutty flavor. I yeah. really enjoy cooking with it. Um, and every time, it's funny, every time I eat a red thing, I'm like, there you go, little Akamanzia. <laughs> Here's some red food. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I had, I had a similar thing too. I was in Southeast Asia 
um, in Sumatra just about a month back and getting these beautiful big dragon fruits, which are gorgeous and red on the inside and the most amazing floral pinky red. And that feeds acromantia. So every time I was eating one, I'm like, yeah, doing it from acromantia, little treats, tropical treat, because in typical Hobart, we don't get for dragon fruit very often. So it's very much a treat from Ackermans. It's not very tropical down in Tasmania, sadly. <laughs> no, we get good berries though, I must say, and black black currants galore. Um, so there are pluses, but but not dragon fruit. Yeah. Now we'll talk about so so one of the recommendations out of the Ubiome Explorer test for me was around let's look at the nutrition and red food was a really important part of my puzzle, as well as diversity, so I can start to yeah. rebuild those populations. But we also looked at pre and probiotics, and this is a question that I get asked all the time: which is the best prebiotic, which is the best probiotic for SIBO? Now we looked at we yeah. we developed or you gave me recommendations based on my Ubiome Explorer test because we knew exactly what was what is in my gut. Yeah. Should we just be taking any pre and probiotic willy-nilly or should we be doing a test like Ubiome Explorer to get a better picture of what's happening so that we can really personalise the, the use of these um, two things? Yeah, it's good questions. I think it depends a bit on the, on the presentation. So, Listen, if I have someone who's, who's coming in, who's just taken a course of, of antibiotics or chemotherapy, I'm not going to wait. If, if, I, if I had a, a, a one-day turnaround time, <laughs> fine. I, I would do that, and then I could, I could totally fine-tune. But I don't. By the time I get the test results, it's going to be two months down the line. It's like, no, this is too long. I will go in with what prebiotic interventions that, that are going to, should do the best job but to, to correct the populations that are usually altered by that intervention. I'd be saying with antibiotics too, um, but with more chronic conditions, then I think it's it's ideal to see what's there um, and to go in because there are nuances in terms of the the impact of different prebiotics between you know galactolagosaccharides versus um, inulin fructolagosaccharides versus partially hydrolyzed guar gum. So they feed different bacteria, yes, and sometimes some, there's some overlap there too, um, but they sometimes will have a greater impact on decreasing certain populations too. So, so lactulose, for example, is great at feeding up different bacteria, feeds up uh, fecalobacterium and brings down bacteroides and proteobacteria really well, amazingly well, better than the other prebiotics. So if, if I've got someone's results in front of me that has you know, 60% bacteroides, then then I'll go, okay, no, you need lactulose. Whereas if their bacteroides is 20%, then I might go with GOS or FOS, you know, all other things being equal. So I think you, you're able to, to tailor things far better with uh, a result. Um, so that's the ideal scenario. But I can, as I said, there are obviously acute situations where you're just going to go in with, with what you think is going to be helpful because you don't have the time frame of waiting. And there's other ones where I suppose, you know, I think with the cost being so low, it's best <laughs> if you can to do a test and see where it's actually at. But you will get some like, you know, partially hydrolyzed guar gum that is generally very well tolerated that increases B trade producing microbes and has a mild impact on things like bifidobacteria. That is, it is a pretty safe one to experiment with. And even most patients with SIBO, not all, most, most patients with IBS tolerate it well. And, and That's being partially hydrolyzed guar, guar gum. Yeah, so sometimes it's just maybe you start with a quarter teaspoon and slowly work out for those people that are sensitive or a tiny pinch a day for a week or two pinches a day for a week and then you slowly work out, but you can generally get there even with the most sensitive people. And I think that's really important. And I think um, because so many people share their protocols on some of the big online forums that other people then just follow them because they're desperate for some answers and, and yeah. some treatment options. And uh, I hear regularly people are having really strong reactions to these things. And I do wonder if it's because they're having a full dose. And I know when I start out, when I started out with my pre and probiotics, I was starting out with the teeny tiniest little amounts of them yeah. and just slowly, slowly, slowly building up. And it, it took me about a month to build up to a full dose because I just went slowly. I'm not in a, in a sprint race with this. I know yeah. this is a lifetime uh, journey, so I don't need to try and have everything at full strength within a day. I can wait a month to slowly 
increase so that my, my body and my little bacteria can cope with this sudden influx That's of right. these new foods. <laughs> Yeah, exactly, because the, the populations change as a consequence. And the populations that deal with gas change too. But if you, it's been overwhelming all at, all at once. And that's something I learned from my first clinical trial I did back in 2000 on my poor patient population, irritable bowel syndrome patients. I gave them full doses of, of lactulose and inulin. Um, so that was like a double, <laughs> double prebiotic dose at therapeutic doses in these poor people were like farting like crazy. And this is, you know, well and truly before the FODMAP stuff came out. So, you know, I'm, you know, I'm just basing it on research and a much clinical experience, but yeah, and lots of bloating and distension. You sort of realize then that no, um, and particularly in sensitive populations, you start with low dose and it's sometimes a teeny tiny dose and, and work your way up and it generally will work. And that's it. Really as I, but it's still, Sorry, I was going to say it still helps if you if you know what the ecosystem is like, then it, it sort of helps you to persist with the one that you know is going to be helpful to to, to help bring balance to that ecosystem. Yeah. So it really is as the takeaway, as I understand it, is if you're in an acute situation, like you've come off a, a round of antibiotics or something really impactful like chemotherapy is to is to work with your practitioner to help support the gut repopulation but if you're dealing with a chronic condition like SIBO like myself where I've been dealing with this for a lifetime um, taking the time to do a test like you biome explorer to get a good clear picture of what's going on in your gut so that you can then really yeah. tailor the approach that that as I understand it that's the way you would um approach it with your patients yeah i think that would be right actually because i'm thinking of other conditions like depression and anxiety things that are, that are more chronic we know that the microbiome plays a, a pretty key pivotal role in, in contributing to uh, being one of the causes if not the main cause chronic fatigue syndrome would fit in that same picture so rather than guessing what's going on have a look <laughs> because you know i know that endotoxins for example were definitely problematic for for chronic fatigue syndrome but when I do a test, yes, certainly some people have really high proteobacteria um, that needs to be addressed and other people don't. So in which case I actually treat it differently. And this is where that, that getting the test result makes a difference to, to the, the final treatment in the end for that patient. Even if they have the same disease label of chronic fatigue syndrome or depression, it was to come up with a different treatment approach based on a different microbiota picture. Mm. And I really see this is where our medical journey is going more and more in the future, which is exciting that it's more personalized, tailored uh, treatment protocols rather than this carte blanche, one size fits all approach, which, you know, it, it just, it only works for a percentage of the population because we're, yep. we are all different. We're all unique. And I think that one of yeah. the challenges amongst the SIBO community is we're all looking for that quick fix because we don't want to feel sick any longer. Um, and it can be frustrating that it can take time to uncover all of your pieces that have led to this overgrowth and your system not working optimally and that can be a real challenge mentally to come to terms with that because we we yeah. have been conditioned in the western world to take a few pills and be fine and uh and that just isn't often the case with SIBO how do you work with your patients just around the the emotional and mental component of pulling together a full picture to really get a yeah. good quality treatment and outcomes i think it's, it's often about chatting to them around expectations and time frames you know i think that's something i do better now than i did when i was more of a junior practitioner um probably because it's based on so many people's experiences that you get a rough idea of how it usually takes things like i know how long it usually takes to treat the acute phase of SIBO now does it always take that long no occasionally it's shorter occasionally it's longer but how much it usually takes and then i know how long it usually takes for the secondary stages you know so i tend to walk people through that at that first sort of, if i'm lucky enough to get them at that first time point of, of diagnosis um then then we we will talk about what that actually means in the duration treatment and what they can expect and at what time points we'd expect things to be able to broaden the diet for example and start including these other sort of foods Let's just finish up on um, repopulating the gut. 
through things like fecal microbial transplant, you were talking about breast milk inoculation, which is yep. interesting, and also things like fermented foods or cultured foods. Um, yep. So let's start with FMT, so fecal microbial transplant. Obviously, there's a lot of interest in this. People often wonder, could they do this and rid their SIBO? Is it a treatment option for SIBO? Or is it more that we're looking at diversity in the large bowel and that's why we would use it? Uh, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I personally wouldn't see it as a, as a SIBO treatment. I would see it as a way of improving the microbiome in someone post SIBO, for for example, where where their ecosystem may well have been damaged from you know a long time with restricted diets, lots of herbal antimicrobials, and biofilm busting products, and mixture of antibiotics thrown in. I've seen some very disturbed ecosystems as a, as a consequence of, of that sort of combination of effects, uh, in which case a, a fecal transplant could be a way of, of re-inoculating in, into it. So, I mean, I, I could see it as a component of that, but I certainly wouldn't see it as, as a cure-all for it. And you would see that, you know, I think that often in SIBO patients that there's a degree of, of large bowel inflammation and visceral hypersensitivity that, that is part of the picture as well. And, if we just treat the, the SIBO a bit, yeah, we can decrease bug counts and the SIBO is gone, but they're still getting gut symptoms from legumes or something. It just may be happening at, at three or four hours now instead of at you know, half an hour after eating it. And to me, it's like, okay, well, we haven't dealt with that underlying issue there. And again, the, the, the composition of the ecosystem may well be playing a role in, in persistence of symptoms in that large bowel um, and the lack of healing. Um, and in some cases you might go, okay, God, if your diversity score is 1% and we, I will often try as the first port of call to, to actually restore an ecosystem before I'll just go, no, you need an FM. I'd suggest talking to someone about getting an FMT. I'd often more, my first port of call is always trying to, to restore an ecosystem as best we can and see what shows up. And um, so there might be a time where, where, you know, FMT is the only way of, of providing the right bacteria in that colon that will actually help improve healing, decrease inflammation, decrease visceral hypersensitivity. That's really interesting. And uh, I know there's a lot of discussion around FMTs. One thing I often wonder is how do we know that the poo, poo <laughs> sample we're getting from somebody else is actually healthy? Like, do we know enough yet around our gut Ooh, yeah. to know that we're giving the right sample to somebody that needs it? Good question. And, and I think there'll be some people's point of view will be we certainly don't have enough evidence at this time point to work, work that out. I um, mean, I think that'd be the more conservative side of, of the picture uh, who, who like having a tremendous amount of, of studies up before they'll accept an intervention. Uh, and I'm, I'm not in that category. I'm much more over in the, the, the few, few studies category um, for intervention that that's, that's safe. But I think it does come back to the health of the donor and screening. Um, and this is something I'm, um, think could be done better by a number of places that offer FMTs is that they often won't, won't do something as simple as a biome or something similar, a similar test using DNA technology to see what's there, you know? Um, and for me, that would be the most pivotal thing is I want to know what that ecosystem is of that donor. Is it better? Because <laughs> I've seen pe people post FMT who actually didn't have a very good you know, one week afterwards, their, their ecosystem wasn't very good. Um, it's, you know, 70% back to roadies and it was like really out of whack. And, and yes, after two and four months of, of treatment, we were able to bring it into a beautiful balanced ecosystem with higher levels of, of you know, our anti-inflammatory species and lower levels of those pro-inflammatory species. So we got there because the, the other bugs were there in small amounts. So it could be corrected. But, you know, I had another patient who, the one that had the 25% proteobacteria that was probably given over by an FMT because it wasn't there before. They had a series of eubiomes. It's like, ah, oh. so, so that FMT introduced, and it was 22% um, streptococci. It was just like a really imbalanced ecosystem from, from probably just one, one donor that wasn't a very good donor. Um, so I'm, I think that the screening process could be better. And I think that the um, history of the donors should be better. Like I want someone who was, who was born vaginally, who was breastfed, who did not take antibiotics, or minimal, but hopefully not under two years of age and hopefully minimal for in the last, when they, when they were young, when that sort of is much easier to, to cause, you know, permanent extinctions at a, a younger age than older. And I want someone that not, not just, just has an antibiotics in the last three months or six months. I want someone that has an antibiotics for five years as, as, as a donor and who eats a really healthy diet and physiologically well, healthy, fit, 
good mind, meditates daily. <laughs> I want a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but those people who it should be a bit like gold, it should be, you know, it's, it, they should be the ones who are donating stools for, for FMTs. And I don't think we're necessarily choosing enough people like that. And I know there'd be set, not that many of them out there, um, but we should do our best to try to isolate and find those ones who actually fit that criteria. I have thought the same thing myself and I've thought, oh my gosh, I, if I was going to do an FMT with somebody, I would, I would want to know everything about them before <laughs> yeah. I put their microbiome into me. Now, you talked about breast milk. Um, is that something that you could see that as adults that we could be perhaps drinking or is it more for children? Uh, I think in, like this is talking theoretical because we haven't had the research to look at it yet. And, and for some reason we've, we've found it easier to deal with, you know, um, poo transplants than, than ingesting breast milk from, from other humans. <laughs> That's just often the way it is. Um, that, that will change. But I, I think in terms of bacterial composition and richness, there's no reason why something like breast milk couldn't be used as a way of, of re-inoculating or reseeding the gut in, in, a, in, a, in a way with, uh, that contains a number and a wide breadth of human bacterial species, you know, because that's not that's, that's what we don't get in, in, in cultured food and fermented foods is we don't find fecalibacterium, acromanzia, um, subdelagranulum, anaerostipes. They're not, they're human gut species. They're not found in, in cabbage or, or um, any other sort of fermented food. So you can't reseed those species from, from a medium that doesn't contain them. Yeah, whereas something like breast milk or feces does contain those same species, hence why we can reseed and repopulate that way. And then, and then it's around the cultured foods, fermented foods. Obviously, there's huge amounts of um, promotion of, of things like sauerkraut and kombucha and kimchi at the moment. It just feels like every second I'm looking at someone else posting a post about, oh, look at my oh, kefir that I've made at home. Yeah. How important is it for us to be eating these um, fermented and cultured foods for diversity and, and good gut health? Ah, now, that's a big question. And I'm trying to think of the best way of, of approaching it. You know, I, I love fermented foods and I eat them, eat them daily. Um, and I have for, you know, since I first started in series 18 years ago, I was making my first batches of sauerkraut, you know, so it's been an ongoing thing for me. And I come from Ukrainian and German background, both of my parents grew up with big vats of sauerkraut in their, in their basements. So, you know, it's part of my, my familial passing on as well. Um, but I think it's, there's a over statement of, of the impact that they have. And particularly around this reseeding and re-inoculating aspect, because when you look at a gut ecosystem, you can do that pretty easily with the biome. You can look at a, a, an ecosystem that's found in sauerkraut or kefir or kimchi. They do not look the same. They do not share almost any species in common, bar lactobacilli. There might one genera that they might be both in guts and, and there. So I think this idea of reseeding using those things is is is, is nonsensical because you, you can't you're not putting in species that are that are lacking, um, and and you're putting in species that that are good at you know fermenting cabbage. Um, does that mean that they grow well in your gut? That's another big question, um, and generally, generally no. Um, and and two. You, you can do follow-up testing, eat some sauerkraut for, for two weeks and then wait two weeks and do another new biome test. It's, the species aren't going to show up anymore because they don't permanently colonize. So you do get a, a temporary improvement of diversity. There's no doubt when you eat um, fermented foods, same with eating you know, some soil on your carrots, same with eating you know, more raw fruits, vegetables, nuts, you get this bacteria on them. You know, and they, they will be temporary visitors to your gut and they will temporarily improve your diversity score whilst you take them but a couple of weeks afterwards, no longer. They aren't, aren't permanent members of your ecosystem. They're temporary visitors. And I think that's what's sometimes forgotten. Now, for an ecosystem that is severely low in diversity, that adding in another 10 species from sauerkraut, another 10 from kefir, probably is going to be very helpful <laughs> because there's just such a lack of diversity. The ability of some of these microbes to interact with our, our immune system, while well, the temporary visitors, is, is a different story. We, they, they, you can have therapeutic effects from these, these, these microbes from that, that temporary um, interaction, but it's just, I think, that a misnomer to think that you're reseeding or recolonizing. Thank you for answering that question because it does 
uh, provide a lot of debate online amongst yeah. the SIBO community. Now, you've got a really fantastic Meet Your Microbiome course that anybody that's really interested in learning more about, uh, you know, the basics around the microbiome could do. And I do have a link for that on the show notes page. So do head to thehealthygut.com forward slash diversity. But in, you know, in 30 seconds, what's the course all about? Why would somebody uh, do your online course? Yeah, it's essentially, the name does it well, Meet Your Microbiome. It's the idea of the course is to teach members of the general public that are you know, not necessarily health professionals, I've got a different level course for health professionals, to, to be familiarize yourself with that, that ecosystem to a far greater degree, meet the key, the key players, both the ones that, that are key healthful players and the ones that might be causing you harm. Um, and it works ideally if you, if you go alongside a, something like a biome result. It's not needed, but if you got your own, it makes it more interesting because you can go, okay, where am I at? Where should I be at? What can I do to diet-wise to, to actually change that? So, And I think it, it gives a lot of empowering information to, to sort of make those changes and to really understand why. And I think when I've had sort of my own patients who, who end up doing the course, um, and I, I do do the course here in Hobart lo- locally as well, um, it just really changes the way people view their gut. It changes the way they view food because they're now looking at, okay, what am I feeding my microbes when I eat this? And it really changes your perspective and i think it's important we remember that we are you know, super organisms or holobionts that we are mostly microbe and partly non-microbe in terms of our whole makeup and it's important that we learn more about that non you know the, the microbe component of our cells and how to nurture certain components of that so there's a whole bunch of flow on benefits and i think that's the key thing the more research that's done on the microbiome the more important we actually see it being for for not just gut health but mental health um, and other aspects the cardiovascular health etc so i think if you once you learn those those important aspects of how to feed and nurture certain species and how to you know do less feeding the ones you don't want it puts you in quite a good state to actually make the changes and change your microbiome one of the great things about doing the meet your microbiome course and the link is in the show notes the healthygut.com forward slash diversity is that it really helps you to know what's going on in from just a basic bacteria level and i find it great when i sit down to eat my um, very plant-based food meals now i get so excited about the food that's going into my bacteria i'm all like there you go little bacteria have a wonderful time with that and and it's also really helped make um, the decision-making process around food easier because I know many people get really guilty about eating junk food or highly processed food. And now it's not even a question because I just go, I'm not doing that. I'm not putting that Holocaust of food into my gut. I am giving my bacteria good quality um, nutrition because I really want to get my diversity score up. And that's something that, uh, you know, hopefully in the coming months, Jason, you and I can come back and do a bit of a, an, a wrap up on how my gut has gone. Um, yep. Did my diversity improve? And I look forward to sharing those results with everybody. So hopefully you'll come back with me and we'll do a wrap up in, in the coming months around did, did Rebecca's diversity go from 62 to could I get it into the 70s or maybe even the 80s? That would be amazing. <laughs> Indeed, let's, let's hope so. Let's hope so. And I always find new biomes a bit like Christmas presents because it's like, I don't know what I find. I open it up. It's like even the, I mean, the returning ones are, are even more exciting in some ways because you get a chance to see what's actually changed from the interventions that the patient has implemented and the changes that they've made. It's always super exciting. It's so exciting. Dr. Jason Horolek, thank you so much for coming back on the Healthy Gut Podcast and uh, sharing your amazing knowledge on the microbiome with us and talking about uh, building diversity back into the gut. As I've said a few times in the podcast, if you'd like to get the show notes from today's episode, all you need to do is head to thehealthygut.com forward slash diversity. And don't forget, if you would like to get the full transcription from today's show, you can do so by becoming a member of the Healthy Gut Podcast. It's absolutely free to join. You just need to pop your name and email address down in the membership box and then you'll get the full transcription from today's episode, which is great because we've used some pretty big names for some of these bacteria, yep. and uh, it will help you to know what we were talking about. Um, and don't forget, guys, come say hi to myself and the team at The Healthy Gut on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, 
Pinterest, uh, Google Plus and Twitter. We're under The Healthy Gut and we love hearing your stories. And you can get my um, food uh, plant-based food tracker as a free download. So head to thehealthygut.com forward slash diversity to download that. And I'd love to hear how many your different plant-based foods you're eating today and how you go at reintroducing foods. We'll be really excited to see what people's numbers are. So thanks for tuning in to the Healthy Gut Podcast. And thank you once again, Dr. Jason Horlick, for joining us on the show. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you with us again. Thanks for the invitation, Rebecca. If you would like to access the show notes from today's episode, make sure you head to thehealthygut.com forward slash podcast. And don't forget that you can join as a member of the Healthy Gut Podcast. It's absolutely free to join up and it means you get the full transcription from every single episode in season two. It's a great way to uh, listen and read along to the podcasts, particularly when brain fog is bad and it's a bit of a challenge to take all of the information in. So head to thehealthygut.com forward slash podcast so you can sign up as a member today. And if you would like to watch the video that accompanies today's interview, make sure you head over to YouTube and search for the Healthy Gut YouTube channel where you will see my interview with Dr. Jason Horolek and you'll also be able to see the images from my Ubiome Explorer results pages. You've been listening to the Healthy Gut Podcast with your host, Rebecca Coombs. To learn more about the Healthy Gut or our podcast, head to thehealthygut.co forward slash podcast. We would like to thank Red Lemon Productions for the production and original music score of this podcast. To find out more about their services, head to redlemonproductions.com. The Healthy Gut Podcast is a production of The Healthy Gut. Thanks for listening.